common patterns in organic synthesis. That'll be the topic of this lesson. And based on the reactions you already know at this point, so at this point in the course, you'd have learned SN1, SN2, E1, E2, alkene reactions, alkyne reactions, free radical halogenation. Based on those reactions, there's a certain number of functional group conversions that we covered in the last lesson that you have at your disposal. And based on those, there's some patterns that are definitely going to emerge in the synthesis kind of questions that you're likely to see at this stage of the game. And we're going to go through those common patterns, then we'll actually work an example of each of these different types of patterns. And when we work these examples, you'll see why they call it retro synthesis, because much of the time we actually work them backwards rather than forwards. Now this lesson's part of my new organic chemistry playlist. I'm releasing these weekly throughout the 2020-21 school year. So if you don't want to miss one, subscribe to the channel, click the bell notification, you'll be notified every time I post a new lesson. All right, so we got our work cut out for us here. And We'll start with the first pattern, and oftentimes you will get started with an alkane, and that's a beautiful thing because, as we mentioned in the last lesson, there's only one functional group conversion, one reaction largely, that you can do with an alkane, and that's turn it into an alkyl halide. And most of the time you'll find out that you're actually going to accomplish this, again, using bromination rather than chlorination, being that it's more selective. Now, in something like cyclohexane, where all of the hydrons are equivalent, you could use chlorination here, and it would be no big deal. And one other thing to note is technically, you could use NBS here as well. So, and again, we should use NBS if we're trying to brominate allylically. But technically, it'll do the same thing as Br2 and light, even when it's not allylic. And so the truth is, a lot of students actually get in the habit of just using NBS if they want to brominate, because it works all the time. Now, if you're doing it in the lab, I mean, in this case, you probably would try and use Br2. It's a little bit cheaper and all that stuff, but on paper, it looks beautiful. So, uh, but I'm gonna try and do what's proper, if you will, and, and reserve NBS for kind of uh, brominating allylically or benzylically. But the truth is, it would carry out the job here as well. And so if we did brominate, here. So we get this lovely alkyl halide. And so there's our first functional group conversion. And so the question is then, well, what can we do with an alkyl halide? Well, there's a few things we can do with an alkyl halide. So, but we're going to really kind of group it into two classes here. So uh, bromine being a good leaving group. So alkyl halides have a good leaving group. We're going to look at substitution and elimination. And so we're going to take a look specifically at SN2 and E2. So SN1 and E1 often compete with each other, and it's hard in many cases to get a good yield of either just SN1 or just E1 because they compete so well with each other. And so if we're doing substitution elimination in organic synthesis, much of the time we'll try and do SN2 and E2 because we have various ways we can distinguish between them, like using a bulky base or not a bulky base, or using something that's a strong nucleophile but a weak base or things of this sort. And so we can often get much better yields of both substitution elimination as long as we're using SN2 and E2. All right, so if we want to do SN2, the big thing here is we've got to use a strong nucleophile. So, and in this case, it's just going to replace that bromine backside attack. And I'm not going to put a specific nucleophile here. So I'm just going to put one on there. It could be a variety of different things that, you know, work. It could be a cyanide. It could be a sulfhydryl group, you know, different strong nucleophiles that could replace the bromine. Okay, great. So, but this wouldn't be the longest synthesis in the world. It'd be one step, two steps, and you'd probably be done at this point because you're probably not going to make a functional group that you know what to do with just yet. However, the elimination route is a little more interesting. And if you want to do elimination here, so you might notice that our alkyl halide here is a secondary halide. And if you want to make sure you're doing elimination and E2 at that, you need a strong base. But to make sure that you've got it, uh, uh, elimination happening and not SN2 competing with it, you might use the bulky base. There's one way of writing potassium t-butoxide, and we use him for two reasons. We use him to form the Hoffman or anti zaitsev alkene, or in the case of a secondary halide, like in this case, whether I form the alkene on this side or this side, it's the same thing. So with secondary halides, we often uh, use the bulky base also, or with a primary halide, to make sure that E2 is happening, not SN2. Now with a tertiary halide, you can't do SN2, so it would only be E2, and it doesn't matter. But for a primary or secondary, using that bulky base ensures that E2 is going to occur as the major product. And so in this case, we're going to form our alkene, and like I said, in this case, it doesn't matter where it forms. And so now that we've got an alkene, that's another one of the functional groups that you've already covered at this point up into the course. And you know a whole host of different alkene reactions. And that would be an option here. You could, you know, 
come down here and you've got a lot of different reactions that would be possible. You know how to turn alkenes into alcohols, alkenes into alkyl halides, alkenes into ethers. You know how to turn alkenes into dihalides. You know how to turn alkenes into halohydrins. You know how to do ozonolysis. You have lots of different alkene reaction options. And so rather than list them all, I'm just gonna put alkene reactions here. There's a lot of them and you just kind of have to be aware of them. So cool, so you could take this a step further and do one of your many alkene reactions that you've uh, learned in, in the first semester. So your other option though, would be to brominate allylically. And if we wanna do that, we definitely wanna use NBS. And in this case, whether I brominate here or here, those are my allylic carbons, it's the same thing. And in this case, due to the symmetry, I don't have to worry about any kind of funky, unexpected product or anything based on resonance here. So if I form this lovely radical right here, you know, we could put the double bond here and share the radical here. And whether I brominate here or on that one, it'd be the exact same thing due to symmetry. So that's what I mean by no unexpected funky products. And so in this case, This kind of squiggly bond because that could be a wedge or a dash. You'd actually get an enantiomeric mixture here uh, of products. So, and we're back to having an alkyl halide. Well, what can you do with an alkyl halide? Same things we could do with it before, both SN2 and E2. And so here, once again, If we do SN2, we need a strong nucleophile. And we'll just do substitution. So and we'll do backside attack. And so if we had the wedged bromine, we'd get the dashed nu nucleophile with inversion of configuration or something like that. So one or the other. So there's SN2 as a possibility, but you could also do E2. And once again, you'd probably wanna use that bulky base and I'll represent him in a slightly different way the structural formula instead. There's potassium t-butoxide drawn another way. And in this case, we would form the alkene right here. Not Can't form here, it turns out, because uh, you can't get 180 degree angles around that, uh, around that carbon inside of a, a ring here. So it can only form right here, and it would form there anyways, because it'll be conjugated. So, and there's our product. And this is kind of some common patterns in synthesis. So you start with an alkane. Only thing you know how to do is turn it into an alkyl halide. Once you have an alkyl halide, you have SN2 and E2 at your disposal. So if you go the route of SN2, there's not a lot you can do with it just yet. So you know, one of the things you could turn it into is an alcohol, and we'll learn what to do with alcohols a little bit later, although we'll find out there's a better way to make an alcohol. So, but you can turn it into an alkene, and there's a lot you can do with an alkene. You could take that alkene and do any one of your you know, 10 or so alkene reactions you've learned. So, but you can also brominate allylically, which then opens up further SN2 or further E2. So lots of options, and this is kind of a common pattern of synthesis. And so now let's take and work an example here. All right, so the synthesis problem we're gonna work here, and we're gonna call this retro synthesis, is we're gonna start with an alkyl halide here, and then try and make this lovely uh, compound here that's both a nitrile and an alkene. And if you look here, so we're starting with an alkyl halide. So if we look at this pattern of synthesis, you don't always start at necessarily the beginning of this pattern. So it's kind of a, you know, if we did notice we could get one, two, three, four steps at the very least and stuff like this. And very common retro synthesis, two to five steps is kind of, uh, kind of the range I give, but I will say that, you know, two to four is much more typical than a five step even. All right, so if we take a look at this, we want to turn an alkyl halide into this lovely structure, and you got to ask yourself a couple questions. So how in the world do you get a nitrile, and how do you make an alkene? Well, to make an alkene, we've got elimination. We definitely should use E2, uh, preferably. And then to make a nitrile, the only way you know how to do that is in an SN2 reaction. And so you've got options here. So we need to make an alkene, we need to make a nitrile. Alkene from E2, nitrile from SN2. The question is, which one was the last one we did? And that leaves us with a couple of options. So. It could have been that we already had an alkene and we needed to make a nitrile, or it could have been that we already had the nitrile and we needed to make the alkene. So either one of these is possible. And so we're kind of working our way back in time in history here as we're making this. And this is why they call this retrosynthesis. So as we work our way back here, we look at this and say, okay, well, if 
had this, what would it take to turn it into this? Well, again, cyanide, we can only make that with an SN2. And so if I was going to try and be doing this, I would have to have a good leaving group in that exact location. So I'd already need to have probably in all likelihood a bromine right there. So, but could we pull this off? Yep, we totally could. And I'd probably use like sodium cyanide and a good polar aprotic solvent if I want to do SN2. Uh, might be like DMSO or acetone or something like that. Now, what if I wanted to make the alkene instead? Well, if I wanted to make the alkene, I'd be doing this through E2 elimination, which would also require me to have a good leaving group. So, but I got some options here because that good leaving group would need to be on one of these two carbons. And so I could have it on this carbon, that would be an option, or it could have been on this one as well. And here's where we run into our first problem. Because if, you know, we'd, we'd add a strong base to carry this out, by the way, so, but we're going to find out we're not even going to make this a viable option, because if we add that strong base, if the bromine is on this carbon, well, then you could form the alkene here or here, and it would be more substituted right here, and it would preferably form in this location, not the desired one. So that's not going to work from a synthesis perspective. And then if the bromine's here, well, both sides are equally substituted, and so you know, maybe roughly half the time, let's say, you might form right here, but the other half, you might form it here instead. And so the truth is you might get as, you know, most somewhere around a 50% yield of the product we want. So the truth is this is not a great way to make it either. So, however, starting with this alkyl halide right here, this is the only reaction. This is a strong nucleophile, but a weak base. So you can do SN2. Don't have to worry about E2 competing. So, and that's going to be the major product. Life is good. And so looks like we should be doing this step last as a result. And so the question then is, well, then how do we make this? And if we look at this, now this bromine right here could be this bromine, or this bromine could be the good leaving group used to make the alkene. And so we got a couple different options here as well. So we could look and say, okay, well, Maybe the bromine's already there and we got to make the alkene or maybe the alkene's already there and we've got to add the bromine. Okay, well, let's make that look a little better. So you might realize that, oh, that bromine is attached on a special carbon right there. That is the allylic position. And we definitely know a way to pull off brominating in the allylic position, NBS. So here I'm going to use NBS and light heat or peroxide. I preferably choose light. So, and that would put the bromine specifically on that location. That would be the product. So whereas here, to make an alkene here, that means I'd have to have another leaving group so that I could do E2 elimination. And then, you know, potentially with two leaving groups, things get a little confusing and where is it going to form and stuff. And it's possible, but it's not the most plausible. So I'm not going to cross it off just yet, but I'll keep it in mind. But this was a nice, beautiful reaction, one we know how to do. And so the question is, well, how do you make an alkene? Well, how do you make an alkene? Well, we do that with E2 elimination. And what do you use for E2 elimination? A nice strong base with an alkyl halide. Well, we have an alkyl halide. We've worked our way back all the way to our original reactant and it is an alkyl halide, exactly what we need in order to carry out this reaction. So in our nice favorite strong base here, so for a secondary halide would be our tert butoxide. And indeed, that is now the entire completed synthesis. Could we have potentially gone this route? Yes, but it wouldn't have been the greatest. We would have had to get like two bromines on this and we'd have found out that you don't get a lot of ways to regulate that when there's all secondary carbons around the way. So if we wanted to you know, do free radical halogenation twice or something like that, it would have been problematic. Maybe we could have made an alkene and added BR2 and an inert solvent and put bromines on two adjacent carbons. And that's possible, but now we're getting into a lot more steps. And there's a, a rule in synthesis. If there's more than one way to get from your starting material to your final product, the shortest pathway is preferred. And so if they differ by like one step, most professors will usually give you either all the credit or almost all the credit, either one you pick. So however, if one's like two steps and one's like seven steps, you should be doing the two-step method. So in a lab, every step in your synthesis, if you gotta do, you've gotta purify and you're gonna lose some of your product and you got a chance to not get you know good yields and all that stuff. And so the longer the synthesis, the lower the yield generally. And so the best synthesis is the one with the fewest steps. And so in this case, if we take a look, we've got step number one right here. Step number two right here, 
And then step number three right here. We carried out this synthesis in three steps. That's a great synthesis. Any other route we might have tried to go would have definitely come out longer than three steps. And again, probably wouldn't have given a great yield. So I say that, you know, in principle, we couldn't cross this out. But the truth is, it wasn't going to be a great synthesis regardless. All right, so we're taking a look at a second pattern. And truth be told, this one's uh, got some similarities to the first pattern we saw. So we're going to start ourselves with an alkane yet again. So, and the only thing you can do, once again, with an alkane is free radical halogenation. So in this case, I'm going to use Br2 and light. Again, NBS would accomplish the same thing, even though it's not allylic. So just not typically the way you do it in the lab. So, but you got one tertiary carbon with a hydrogen there. He's the most substituted, and that's where bromination is going to take place. So, and now we've made an alkyl halide. All right, now that we've got an alkyl halide, so what's at our disposal? Well, in this case, this guy's a tertiary halide, which means instead of having both SN2 and E2 at our disposal, like in the last example, SN2 is off the table. And we're not really going to consider SN1. I'm not saying that we couldn't potentially try to maybe do some SN1, but once again, SN1 and E1 often compete with each other, and it's hard to get a good yield of either one in many cases. And so in this case, we really just got E2 as a consideration. But with a tertiary halide, so generally this is where the whole zaitsev hoffman debate comes into play, and you've got a couple options. So you've got two different types of bases that you might consider using. So you might use a standard base, like sodium hydroxide, sodium methoxide, sodium ethoxide. I'll use sodium methoxide, but they're standard bases. They're not bulky. So and you're generally going to form the Zaitsev product. And so if we look here, we've got our alpha carbon on the tertiary. So and then we've got three different beta carbons two that are secondary and then one that is primary. And so with a non-bulky base, we should prefer the more substituted ones because with the more substituted, more stable alkene. And so in this case, whether I form the alkene here or here, it's symmetrical, it'd be the same thing either way. Cool, but your other option would be to use your bulky base. I'll use potassium t-butoxide here. And in this case, then we'd use the primary beta carbon and form the alkene, the least substitute alkene, the Hoffman or anti zaitsev alkene. Cool, which is this guy. So still an alkene. And an alkene doesn't start with an H. I don't know where I'm getting that there. Cool, but we can form that alkene in two different places, which is why now that we've got alkenes and we've got all these different alkene reactions that are possible, I'll just kind of represent that like so, and just kind of say, like we did in the last example, alkene reactions. And once again, we know how to turn alkenes into alkyl halides, uh, alcohols, ethers, dihalides, halohydrins, uh, ozonolysis can break it up and get us ketones and aldehydes or ketones and carboxylic acids. Lots of options here is the key. So. But one of those lovely alkene reactions that you learned along the way, we got a 10 or 12, depending on uh, how many were covered in your class. Cool. And this is one of these common patterns in synthesis where it's not just about, you know, knowing that you turn alkane into alkylate and then alkylate into alkene, but which alkene? Do you use a standard base and get the zaitsev of alkene? Or do you use a bulky base and get the Hoffman or anti zaitsev of alkene instead? And that's all going to be governed upon where the two things that you're added are going to end up. If the two things you add end up on these two carbons, well, then by all means, make the zaitsev of alkene. If you do an alkene addition reaction and the two things you add end up on these two carbons, then by all means, use the Hoffman product instead. All right, let's take a look at an example. All right, so here's our lovely reactant. It's an alkane, and we want to end up with this lovely alkyl halide right here. And uh, in this case, again, we usually approach this at retrosynthesis, and there's, I make one major exception. It's not the only exception, but I'll, I will make this exception. If you start with an alkane, there's only one thing you know how to do, and you can work that one step forward. And that one thing is free radical halogenation. And so rather than starting at the end here, we are going to make one step forward, because it will make it easier to go back when you don't have to go back so far. And so free radical halogenation here, we're not trying to do a little clear or anything. So again, Br2 and light, although NBS and light would accomplish exactly the same task. And it'll replace a hydrogen on the most substituted carbon, on the tertiary carbon in this case, where we can replace a hydrogen. 
And so notice, we know how to turn an alkane into alkyl halide, just not the alkyl halide we ultimately want in the end. But we do have an alkyl halide, and once you have an alkyl halide, you should be like, okay, I can do SN2 or E2. Well, in this case, we can't do SN2 because he's tertiary, just like the example we saw again. So we really only got E2 as an option. And so we got to look and say, well, where do we want to form this alkene? Do we want to form it in one of these two positions, the Zaitz of alkene, or in this position, the Hoffman alkene? And based on where I want to add some things, I can figure that out. So, but rather than again continuing to work this forwards, we're now going to go back and work it back. But rather than having to work it all the way back to here, I know that I just got to work it back to here. So in this case, we want to make an alkyl halide. How many different ways can we make an alkyl halide? Well, the truth is we could potentially make an alkyl halide in an SN2 reaction. If I had some other leaving group there, so I could potentially, you know, add, you know, like sodium bromide in an aprotic solvent and voila. So that other leaving group's probably another halogen though. And that kind of doesn't help me because I know it just means I need to get some other halogen there. Well, how do I get some other halogen there? Well, not very easily. This is on a primary carbon, on a less substituted carbon. Free radical halogenation is never going to put it there. So, however, the other pathway for getting a halogen in that carbon would be if you had an alkene and it involved that carbon right there. And the only alkene you could have involving that carbon is one between these two. So if we did have that, you can see that, oh, this would be the addition of H and Br anti Markovnikov, which occurs when you add HBr with peroxide, R-O-O-R here. Cool, and that's the only really, you know, way we can pull this off. Because I could get a leaving group here, that's true, but the truth is if I want to get any sort of leaving group there, I'm probably going to have to put a bromine there first and then replace the bromine with that one. But the whole point is to replace that one with a bromine. So kind of circular logic. We're not going to really get there. Not going to be a viable pathway in this case. So we do need this alkene. And to make an alkene, it's going to make it an elimination and you need an alkyl halide. Well, we have an alkyl halide. And I need one of these two carbons to have the halogen and one of them does. But this would be the Hoffman or anti zaitsev product, which means we're going to need to use the bulky base. Cool. And that's our synthesis. Notice just three steps. And like I said, we call this retro synthesis because we're usually trying to work these backwards. So however, you do, if you start with an alkane, you can work one step forward because the only thing you can do is free radical halogenation. Cool. And these are your first couple of patterns for organic synthesis. So in the next lesson, we'll do some more patterns in organic synthesis that involve alkynes, which we did not involve here. So, but if you found this lesson helpful, would you consider giving me a like and a share? A couple of the best things you can do to help promote the channel. And if you're looking for the study guides, if you're looking for practice quizzes, if you're looking for practice final exams, check out my premium course on chadsprep.com.